So hello there. Oh, that was hot. I'm your interim host, Cal Small. This is another episode of Biographics, and today we're talking about King George VI, the reluctant monarch. And as with all the videos here on Biographics, this one is based on original scripts submitted to us by a member of our writing team. The member of that writing team today being Larry Holdsworth, who you can follow on their social media links found below. And while you're down there, why don't you leave a like, a comment with feedback or suggestions for future videos, and subscribe for more content like this. Normally, I would ask this at the end of the video, but the analytics and the people behind the scenes have told me, the earlier you say this, the more likely all three things are to happen, so can you say them early in the video, please? So, yeah. There you go, Eric, Jen, everybody else behind the scenes. Did I do good? Let's get to it. Much of the life of Albert Frederick Arthur George, called Bertie by family and friends, and by me throughout the rest of his video, because it's very funny, can be summed up in one word, unexpected. At the time of his birth, his father held the title the Duke of York, later to ascend to the throne of the United Kingdom and Great Britain as King George V. Bertie was his second son and thus was not expected to ascend to the throne himself. The heir apparent under George V was Bertie's brother, who became King Edward VIII in 1936. Thus, it was his brother who was groomed as the man who would be king. Bertie was prepared for other duties expected of the royal family in the first half of the 20th century i.e. not very much. Bertie was born on December 14th, 1895, the second of eventually five sons. As a child, his health was, shall we say, not strong. His natural inclination was to use his left as his dominant hand, a quirk not tolerated by his family and tutors. He was frequently ill and developed a stutter as a child, another trait which his family considered to be intolerable. Forced to write with his right hand, ashamed of his stutter and prone to tears when frightened, which was often as he was terrified of loud noises and large animals, Bertie became shy and withdrawn. Leg braces intended to correct his knock knees added to his childhood troubles. And is anybody else getting like major Forrest Gump vibes from this? of just like you know when Forrest Gump's little and he's got like little like braces on and he's like oh man you feel so bad for that kid so he starts running real fast it's like yeah you go Forrest Gump though he saw his parents twice a day when they were in residence they had little to do with rearing their children those duties were instead performed by the plebs the nannies the tutors and other servants in the employ of the royal family In 1909, in accordance with family tradition, Bertie entered the Royal Navy as a cadet of the Royal Naval Academy in Osborne on the Isle of Wight. He struggled there as well, finishing last in his class in 1911 before moving on to the Royal Navy College in Dartmouth. By then, he was the son of the King, his father having ascended to the throne in 1910. Naval cadets trained both in the classroom and out at sea, where Bertie quickly demonstrated a tendency towards seasickness, an unfortunate and career-killing malady for one considering a naval career. Bertie never fully overcame his seasickness and his health continued to be problematic. For example, he dealt with ulcers and in the early months of World War I with appendicitis. I've been there. Now wait, your appendix is this side, but mine aren't because mine are gone. Despite his problems, which persisted along with his stutter, Bertie continued to serve and was aboard the HMS Collingwood during the Battle of Jutland in 1916. His service as a Tory officer was sufficient for him to be mentioned in dispatches, an award for gallantry during the battle. Such a performance was certainly, shall we say, unexpected given his persistent ill health, his poor performance in training and his nervous nature. By 1917, he was ashore recovering from surgery for his ulcers and he later returned to service with the Royal Navy Flying Service, learning to fly himself displaying far more aptitude for being in the air than he did on the water. He transferred from the Royal Navy into the newly formed Royal Air Force later that same year. Despite his poor health, Bertie somewhat unexpectedly excelled at sports, particularly tennis. He played well enough to actually enter the men's doubles at Wimbledon in 1926, though he and his partner, Lewis Grieg, were eliminated in the first round. And God damn, imagine like just scoring an ace on the future King of England. Like I would never not tell that story at every family gathering until the day I died. By then he had completed courses in economics and history at the Trinity College and frequently represented the royal family in official appearances. Still, he appeared less confident in public than his brother Edward, the Prince of Wales. He appeared as Albert, Prince of York in his official capacity. Hampered by his stutter, he spoke infrequently in public, which contributed further to his image of being reserved, shy and timid. Huh? Ah, oh look, it's Business Anteater. What are we talking about today, Business Anteater? NordVPN? Okay, let's go. We, we live in a very connected world. There's probably people out there right now watching this on their toilet on, like, you know, their neighbor's Wi-Fi. And that's great, good for you, but it pays to be careful with your data. And you might not think, well, 
I'm just watching a YouTube video on my phone. Like, how, how much data can someone really get from that? And the answer is quite a lot. So it pays to look after yourself. If you connect to a Wi-Fi service that you think is safe, mm -hmm. for example, if you're at a cafe and it just says, insert brand here, Wi-Fi. Yes. For all you know, that might not be the Wi-Fi for that business. That might be some kind of scammer trying to get your information. And yeah, and this is one thing, it's a lot more common than you're thinking. It even has a name. And it's not the man in the mirror attack. So I was going to make a Michael Jackson joke until I remember, no, it's called man in the middle, which makes my joke not make sense. So, and just think about how often it is you'll go into a bar, a cafe, um, a museum, an airport, and just connect to the first, like, strongest connection free Wi-Fi that you can see. And how often do you actually query whether or not that's legit? So this is why NordVPN is a good service. It's because one of the things that they'll do is encrypt the data that you are transmitting from your device, no matter where that data goes. So you could connect to this other person's Wi-Fi, but they still wouldn't be able to get anything from you. And you might think, well, what, why would I care? It's like, we've all got stuff on our phone that we've searched for that we don't <laughs> want anybody else knowing about. Let's be honest here. Another good thing about NordVPN as well yes. is you just need one account to cover all the household devices. Yes, up to six, I believe. And I am like an extreme edge case here. And I have one, two, uh, three, four, five, and then six in the other. So I've got six devices just for me as one person. I'm an extreme edge case and I would still be protected. NordVPN also has a threat protection feature which protects you from ads, trackers, and malware. So yeah, if you are like looking up any weird sites, Carl. For work. <laughs> it does prevent you from visiting malicious sites and uh, scans any files that you download as well. Yeah, I do download a lot of files. <laughs> For work. For work. <laughs> I always do. But yes, thank you to today's sponsor, NordVPN. Check out NordVPN and get four months extra on a two-year plan by going to nordvpn.com forward slash bio. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. And guys, a thing we've been doing with our sponsor spots recently is ending them with an extra bonus fact you'll find nowhere else in the video. So would you like the bonus fact for today? Yay! Okay, did you know that zoos around the world keep accidentally trying to make gay sloths? So, like, you know, many animals display something known as sexual dimorphism, essentially just the difference between a male and female of the species. Sloths don't really have any of that, to the point where experts on them can't really tell the difference between a male and a female. And I know what you're thinking, like, Brad and Nisha, surely they can just, like, you know, just pop that tail up and just see what's hanging between their legs? Well, male sloths have what is described as incredibly small genitalia. <laughs> So small, in fact, they are almost impossible to see. So this, coupled with like the fact that male and female examples of the species look virtually identical, means that zoos across the world have frequently tried to get breeding pairs of sloths that are either male-male or female-female, and then got really annoyed when they don't breed. Isn't that fun? During the Edwardian era, members of all Europe's royal houses were expected to intermarry, in part because he was not expected to ascend to the throne, his brother being the heir apparent, Bertie was given, shall we say, considerable leeway when it came to his choice of bride. In 1920, Bertie began courting Elizabeth Bowers Lyon, the daughter of the Earl of Strathmore and the wife of Cecilia, Countess of Strathmore. Bertie proposed marriage twice, first in 1921 and then in 1922. Both times, his intended refused him, dissuaded by her own mother, who warned Elizabeth of the duties of the royal family. Reminding the duties of the royal family are just standing there and doing this. Actually, no, if you're the queen, I think it's this. That's the royal wave, isn't it? In 1923, the persistent Bertie, then the Duke of York, won her hand and they were married later that same year. The fact that he had married someone not of royal family was noted in the press in a welcoming manner for the most part. It was considered to be a step forward in the terms of modernisation of the royal family and its image. The couple spent a full 16 months touring His Majesty's dominions in Africa, during which they went on safari searching for big game. Their marriage was, by all accounts, a fairly happy one and produced two daughters. Elizabeth, nicknamed Lilibet, was born in 19. And their second daughter, Margaret, was born in 1930. Unlike the events of his own childhood, Bertie remained close to his children and involved himself in their daily lives. Though they could have used one of several different royal palaces and homes as their main residence, they instead chose to reside in London at 145 Piccadilly, a five story house in Green Park. It remained their home until Bertie ascended to the throne, though he sometimes resided at the Royal Lodge after 1932.
Bertie found the requirements of his role as a member of the royal family and his stutter incompatible during the 1920s. His speaking engagements became agonising for him and embarrassing for those forced to endure sitting through them. After his return to Britain in 1925, Bertie engaged the services of one Lionel Logue, a self-taught elocutionist and speech therapist who had been, for the most part, dismissed as a fraud by the mainstream medical community. Speech therapy at the time had not been considered discipline. Logue diagnosed the Duke's problems as being one of poor coordination between his diaphragm and larynx, which could be corrected through breathing exercises. The exact exercises prescribed by Logue for the future king are unknown. The Duke and Mentor did work together on his problem each day for about an hour and Bertie continued exercise on his own prior to speaking to anyone. Gradually he learned to release the tensions which led to his stutter and speak slowly and clearly. His progress was quite rapid and by 1927 he was able to address the Parliament of Australia, delivering prepared remarks smoothly without stuttering once. Despite his success, Bertie continued to work with Logue for many years. In 1952, after George VI's sudden death, his widow wrote to Logue, I think that I know perhaps better than anyone just how much you helped the king. Not only with his speech, but throughout his whole life, an outlook on life itself. And just because I knew people would be curious, because I myself was curious, I did some independent research on this while familiarising myself with the script and could not find any evidence one way or the other whether or not that moment in the King's speech where Logue advises the King to swear a lot is accurate. There are some sources saying that it is, where there's some that deny it because swearing a bunch is not really something becoming of a king. And if people aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, in the film The King's Speech, where Bertie, the subject of today's video, is played by Colin Firth, there is a moment in the film where his elocutionist notes that, well, when you swear, you, you don't stutter. You should swear more. And they have this great, just one minute long scene of Colin Firth just being like, bugger, 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 ah! And it's great, and it's fantastic. Unfortunately, I could find no evidence of that actually taking place. There was a couple of people, like, close to the film who said they think that it does, but they couldn't cite any sources out of fear of, like, you know, like, NDAs and just not wanting to upset the royal family. Although I did find a few articles talking about the fact that swearing can be a useful verbal crutch for people who struggle with stuttering and the like. The idea being that because swearing comes so naturally to you, um, it allows you to just you know, think of the next word so that your speech flows more freely. And a proponent of this theory and an example of it working is the actor Samuel L. Jackson who reportedly suffered from a terrible stutter early in his childhood and was able to overcome it uh, via judicious use of the word motherfucker. Check out the big brain on bread. You're a smart mother. Uh, another actor who suffered with a terrible stutter was the actor James Earl Jones, who was reportedly functionally mute for most of his childhood until he hit puberty and just, you know, that voice came out of his mouth and then he was able to be more confident in his speech. And I myself um, suffer from a stutter as a child and something people may notice um, uh, as I go through these videos is I have a very peculiar way of speaking. You've probably heard it just that I have a almost sing-songy, like rising and then lowering intonation to my voice. And that's just a coping mechanism I came up with where to avoid me getting marble mouth and stumbling over my words, I will occasionally slow down how I'm speaking and speed up and go back down to avoid myself becoming too overly excited when talking. So yeah, I couldn't find out definitively whether or not um, uh, King George just stood in his study screen, bugger, 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 and but there's some evidence to suggest that he did, and that's kind of hilarious. Moving on. Overcoming his stutter corresponded with growing self-confidence and assurance. The Duke often flew himself to appearances as he went about his royal duties. He developed an interest in industry and the contributions of labour to production. Bertie also took a deep interest in the working class and job conditions. The press began to call him the Industrial Prince, a nickname which took hold when he served as the president of the Industrial Welfare Society. Still, his elder brother he remained destined to become the next king. Bertie remained third in line to the throne after his father, who occupied it, and his elder brother, who was unmarried and childless status meant that the Duke of York was his heir. George V had five sons, though the last of his children, Prince John, died from complications of epilepsy in 1919 at the age of 13, he also had a daughter, Mary, Princess Royal. The line of succession ran through his sons, Edward, Albert, Prince Henry and Prince George. Henry exhibited tendencies towards affairs, shocking the morals and sensibilities of the day, similar to those of his elder brother, Edward. Prince George, as well, enjoyed several scandalous affairs. Yet, by the mid-1930s, all the brothers were married except for Edward, heir to the throne, who exhibited little in the way of urgency regarding his marital status. Edward enjoyed his bachelorhood as well as racehorses and other forms of gambling. His father, the king, eyed his sons with thinly veiled disdain, and he grew closer to Bertie during the 1930s as well as his granddaughter Lilibet, who called his majesty, and I quote, Grandpa England. 
Of Edward, he wrote to a friend, after I am dead, the boy will ruin himself within 12 months. He also expressed a hope that Edward would neither marry nor have children, which would leave Bertie as the heir apparent. Edward, for anyone curious, was keenly aware of his father's opinion towards him and their relationship grew strained as Europe marched towards fascism and war in the turbulent 1930s. In 1934, Edward began a relationship with Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee remarried to a shipping magnate. The married Simpson and the heir to the throne did little to conceal their relationship, scandalous though it was. When his father, George V, demanded an explanation, Edward insisted that the relationship was merely a platonic friendship. Members of Parliament and the press expressed concern over the relationship, partly due to the moral outrage at Simpson's marital status, and partly over her status as an American and its potential influence over the British throne. So yeah, just as an idea of how stuffy and up their arse they were back then, being American was just as bad as being a married woman. And that's the I like doing these like scripts on like kings and English history because, you know, my accent does not at all suit the, uh, the the kind of tone you'd expect for an article about King George V. Edward at the time was already suspected of having sympathy for the German Nazi party, which also drew considerable support from the German-American Bund and other similar groups in the United States. In January 1936, George V died and Edward ascended to the throne as King Edward VIII. Bertie was elevated to the heir apparent since the unmarried king had no issue. Then Edward shocked the nation by announcing, despite being warned not to, his intention to marry Wallace Simpson as soon as she could be divorced from her husband. His government informed him that he could not marry his intended and retain the throne. Bertie, still residing with his family in the house on Piccadilly, was suddenly thrust into the limelight as the heir. The public was divided. The upper classes, for the most part, were unwilling to accept Edward's choice of bride. The working classes were more supportive. The German Nazi propaganda machine, on the other hand, chortled over the class divide within the British nation. On December 10th, 1936, Edward and his three surviving brothers gathered at Fort Belvedere, a country house in the hands of the royal family. There, Edward signed his letter of abdication after months of legal and religious manoeuvring. At the time of Edward's abdication, Bertie ascended to the throne. It was a position he had neither prepared for, wanted, and according to much of the press and gossip at the time, was ill-equipped physically and emotionally to fulfil. His daughter Lilibet became the heir apparent as the firstborn of the monarch. Edward had not held the throne long enough for a formal coronation ceremony. As March 12, 1937 had been selected for the event, Bertie and the government agreed to let it stand. By the time of his coronation, Bertie had already bestowed Edward and Wallace Simpson with their titles, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. He allowed his brothers to adopt the title of His Royal Highness, but denied it to Simpson. And he further enhanced Edward's finances by purchasing Balmoral and Sandringham from him, which George V's estate had left to Edward personally. And just the idea that just the king just owns houses and just doesn't pay tax on them. Because that's like a thing. Bertie had also dealt with his first major crises. Ireland had responded to the turmoil in the British government over Edward's relationship by abolishing the office of Governor General of the Irish Free State, an appointee of the Crown. It was a major step towards Ireland becoming a republic, yet Ireland was little more than a distraction for the government at the time. British politics and foreign policy in 1937 were largely dominated by appeasement of the expansion of Germany on the European continent. George VI had no choice but to support the policy of his Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, despite the growing protests against them led by Winston Churchill. Churchill. Yes, that Winston Churchill. When Chamberlain returned to Britain, having obtained the Munich Agreement, promising peace in our time. And if you don't know, like, how, like, wrong that was, if we've not done a biographics on Chamberlain, that's, like, on screen right now, ask us in the comments to do one, because, yeah, he was, like, he wasn't wrong. He might have been the most wrong anyone had been that year. He was so wrong. Anyway, the king and his family asked the prime minister to appear with them on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. The appearance of a politician alongside the king was a nearly unprecedented alignment of monarchy with politics. It was also a clear sign that the king intended to modernise the monarchy to meet the new demands of the times. In 1939, George took his intentions one step further, undertaking a tour of North America, which included the United States. And this was the first visit in history of a reigning monarch to America. President Roosevelt personally planned much of Bertie's and his wife Elizabeth's brief six-day visit to the United States in June 1939. He calculated it to ensure the King and Queen received maximum exposure to cheering crowds as the monarch toured Washington DC and New York City. During the Washington phase of the trip, the King visited Mount Vernon, including the tomb of George Washington. A formal state dinner marked his Washington visit. In New York, the royals attended the World's Fair, after which they made a less formal visit, shall we say, to FDR's home in Hyde Park on the Hudson River in New York State. There, FDR held an informal cookout, serving the king the American delicacy of hot dogs on the porch of his mother's house. 
The King's comments regarding hot dogs were, rather unfortunately, not recorded. The FDR library contains a transcript of George VI's handwritten notes made at the time of his trip. The King reported two good conversations as well as many opportunities of informal talks between His Majesty and the President. These talks include discussions of the Neutrality Act, including the possibility of the Americans finding, and I quote, something could be done to make it less difficult for the USA to help us. His Majesty recorded several of FDR's complex plans for naval patrols in the Atlantic in the event of war between Britain and Germany, including the observation if he saw a U-boat he would sink her at once and wait for the consequences. When Britain declared war on Nazi Germany in September 1939 in response to the German invasion of Poland, it did so with the monarch assured of aid from the United States, as far as was possible. FDR's carefully orchestrated tour and the King and Queen's gracious acceptance of American hospitality and policies gave birth to the so-called special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom, which has endured ever since. After the war began and London was being bombed, George's decision to remain in Buckingham Palace rather than be relocated to a safer area resonated with the American people as it did with the British. During the Blitz on London, US newsmen, especially Edward R. Murrow, kept the Americans informed of British determination to not give in. The royal family demonstrated that resolve by remaining in London with their standard flying over Buckingham Palace. In 1940, as France collapsed, Winston Churchill replaced Chamberlain as Prime Minister. The King preferred his longtime friend Lord Halifax, but he learned to work with Churchill nonetheless, and they met weekly over lunch at the palace whenever possible throughout the war. The King and Queen remained at Buckingham Palace throughout the Blitz and later V1 and V2 attacks, sharing the danger with their subjects. The boy, once frightened by any and all loud noises, refused to turn to safety from German bombs exploding overhead. And just as an aside here, that weekly meeting thing is a tradition that continues to this day, and reportedly the current reigning monarch meets the Prime Minister once a week. And although um, the Queen and now the King um, officially do not endorse any particular political party and exude no hard political power. They wield a great amount of what is known as soft power, which is just not necessarily like, you know, just sabre rattling or anything like that, but just oh, a quiet word from them is usually more than enough to sway um, uh, political opinion one way or the other. And just the idea that this, the Prime Minister has to go meet the monarch every week for tea is just hilarious to me. Like, what, what a weird country I live in. Bertie and Elizabeth made several trips to the front during the war, talking strategies with generals and foreign leaders and meeting with the troops to boost morale. While other governments and royal families of Europe went into exile, several in Canada, George and Elizabeth maintained a high public profile, a symbol of British resistance and resolve, most of which was faked, as I'll get to in a moment, because I've researched this independently and it's it, it kind of sucks, but yeah, the once reluctant monarch used the throne to strengthen his people and the British public responded with adulation. When the Germans surrendered in May 1945, huge crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace demanding to see their king. George shared the limelight and accolades with Churchill as he had with Chamberlain several years earlier. And just in regards to that whole like British resolve thing, like stiff upper lip, like, if anyone's familiar with the whole like, you know, just keep calm and carry on. That was like wartime propaganda for Britain of like, you know, stiff upper lip, remain British. Um, much of that was propaganda, both during and after the war. For example, there was a very famous image, which we probably can't show because I believe it's on my Getty Images, which is annoying because it's a part of history, but it's of a milkman continuing on his rounds after the Blitz in London. That was actually like a stage photo op, but it's based on similar, though not exactly accurate stories of people going to work after their places of work were blown to bits by bombs. And it's not so much like just like the British resolve and refusal to give up and just stiff up a litmus. It's just, well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> uh, that said, there are some remarkable stories of just the fortitude of the British population during the time. One of my favourites being that people began discussing the Blitz as if it was the weather. So they'd refer to German bombs the same way they would, like, you know, a dark cloud or a thunderstorm, with housewives being reported as saying, the weather's been a bit blitzy lately. Blitzy meaning the Germans have been dropping bombs on them for the past several weeks. Throughout the war, the royal family, Bertie, Elizabeth and their two young daughters, toured the front lines and home front to boost morale, often at considerable danger to themselves. The princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, moved about several of the houses and palaces of the royal family between appearances, spending much of the war at Windsor Castle. Both served in the auxiliary, Elizabeth, the future queen, as a driver and automobile mechanic, and both made morale-boosting visits and radio broadcasts throughout the war. On VE Day, with the permission of the king and queen, they left the palace balcony to mingle with the crowds. I remember we were terrified of being recognised, Elizabeth would say, many years later. In 
In the post-war years, it quickly became evident that Britain could no longer afford to maintain a global empire. At the same time, independence movements erupted around the globe. In 1947, British India split into two independent dominions, Pakistan and India. The Emperor of India was removed from George VI's many titles that year. India became a republic in 1950, and the King of India was removed from his titles as well. They remained the King of Pakistan. In 1948, the British Mandate of Palestine separated, creating Israel and smaller Arab states, as well as a conflict which has continued to rage for nearly 75 years as of this writing. And, yeah, and as of recording, is still ongoing, and the less said about the better. This is neither the time nor the place. Let's move on. As the British Empire became the British Commonwealth, George and Elizabeth travelled extensively. The end of the empire did not sit well with some, nor did the policies of some of the emerging dominions. Racial segregation quickly came to dominate in South Africa, and when the king toured that country in 1947 to boost his political fortunes over Jan Smuts, the Prime Minister, he was told by local leaders to shake hands with only those presented to him who were white. In 1947, Lilibet, despite some reservations on the part of her mother, announced her engagement to Philip Mountbatten, Prince Philip of Greece. Their wedding on November 20th in 1947 was held in Westminster Abbey, and before the wedding, George VI granted his son-in-law the title of the Duke of Edinburgh. None of the new Duke's German relatives were invited, nor was the former King and Elizabeth's uncle, the Duke of Windsor. The wedding was to have been a symbol of British resurgence and the recovery from the war years. In truth, Elizabeth reportedly needed ration coupons to obtain her wedding dress, a sign that demonstrated Britain's recovery was far from complete. Throughout his life, George VI had seldom displayed what we'd call robust health, and during his adult years he was a heavy smoker of cigarettes. He was seldom without one, even during dinner. In the late 1940s, the effects of a lifetime of smoking and the stresses of the war began to overtake him. He developed circulatory problems, lung cancer, and other related ailments. In May 1951, he attended the opening Festival of Britain, a World's Fair type event which focused solely on the achievements of Britain and ran throughout the summer. He then retired for a complete rest. That September, his left lung was removed, and his health from that point declined quite quickly as is wont to happen when her lungs removed, you know? Elizabeth was representing the king in Kenya in February 1952. The king had not seen her and Philip off at the airport in January when she received the word of her father's death. On February 6th, he died of a coronary at age 56. His funeral was held on St George's Chapel, Windsor, on February 15th. On March 26th, 1969, his remains were transferred to the King George VI Memorial Chapel at Windsor. His wife, the Queen Mother, and his daughter Margaret lie beside him, and in 2022, Queen Elizabeth II, as well as Prince Philip, were interred with them as well. George VI ascended to the throne when it was rocked by scandal, with public faith in the institution of the monarchy at its nadir. In a letter to his brother Edward, whose behaviour and decision led to George reluctantly accepting the throne, he wrote that he had wanted to make it steady again. Through the war and in tumultuous events which followed, he served as far more than just a figurehead. He kept informed of events and circumstances with politicians, field commanders and the troops. He also kept in touch with his people, and by the time his daughter became Queen Elizabeth II, British faith in the monarchy had returned. He restored faith in the monarchy through displays of personal courage and devotion to his family and his people. His daughter took up his mantle, serving through seven decades, frequently fraught with scandal and indiscretions on the parts of other members of the royal family, maintaining a quiet dignity and clear personal courage. That's putting it rather lightly. And today his grandson sits on the throne as King Charles III, facing an imposing legacy left upon him by his mother and his grandfather. So I'm just going to just single out that comment in the script there about indiscretions and scandal and tell everyone at home the story of Prince Andrew. So Prince Andrew, or to give him his proper title, a right bellend, um, was infamous even before his like, most major scandal for being the helicopter prince. And he earned that title by just constantly using the royal helicopter to fly everywhere and anywhere. And I think they even reference this in The Crown, where his first appearance is he just flies in a helicopter. because And he's well known throughout his life for just being one of the worst royals to deal with. If just like any time there's like a royal event and he would turn up, he'd be like, I hate dealing with him. He's just such a prick. And then he was engaged in a scandal, as noted, where he was supposedly, or I should say allegedly, just interacted with someone involved with Jeffrey Epstein. And his, well, I'm going to put it diplomatically, not great interview where he tried to defend himself, which apparently every single one of his royal advisors told him not to do. Um, uh, he responded to the, uh, the claims that uh, he had been pictured with uh, one of Je Jeffrey Epstein's uh, young lady friends and that she reportedly, it was just a detail that she reported that, oh, I just rem remember his like flabby, sweaty, clammy body against my own. He 
defended himself against that claim by saying, well, that possibly can't be me. I can't sweat. Said, what do you mean you can't sweat? And he's like, I can't sweat. I had an overdose of adrenaline during the Falklands War after being shot at, and I can't sweat. In an interview where he's visibly sweating. He also claimed that he could not have been there on the day that this event was said to have occurred because I was at a Pizza Express in Woking, which is, a Pizza Express is just like a crappy pizza chain. And there's no proof that that ever happened. And for some reason, he just never really went anywhere. Anyway, that's a story for another day. And if you would like to see us cover that story, bug us in the comments below with feedback and suggestions for future videos. And if we do a Prince Andrew one, I am definitely putting my name forward to read that one out. And I'll tell you what, as soon as I see that one written, it's going right to the top of my recording pile. And if not, I'll write it my bloody self. Like, I'll tell that to like, you know, my editors behind this. I will write that myself if you want, because that is a story that needs to be told. Anyway, while you're down there, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Follow me on social media. Follow our author, Larry Holdsworth, on social media if you are so inclined. And as always, go out there and have the day you deserve. Cheers!